much for coming. And I, before uh, before I introduce Mark, uh, I just want to just put out a huge thank you to to Lara for for doing so much work to organize this. I've actually been traveling the last three weeks, um, and and I'm a bit jet lagged. So if I slur a bit, that's why. But um, Laura really put this all together pretty much on her own. And it's it's really, really, really exciting to see everybody here in a, a, a lovely gray day here in Scotland. So good to be indoors. Um, seems I missed all the nice weather. But anyway, um, <clears throat> to get started, I want to introduce our first keynote. Uh, really excited to have him here. Uh, it's Dr. Mark Garrett. Going to read his bio here, slightly abridged from what was online, but um, uh, Mark Garrett explores post-digital contexts of working class and gra grassroots culture as part of an intersectional inquiry. He co-founded the Arts Collective Furtherfield as a collaborative platform online in 1996 with artist Ruth Catlow. Um, it has two physical venues, a gallery and a commons lab, both situated in Finsbury Park, London. Garrett has curated over 60 contemporary media arts exhibitions and projects nationally and internationally. He has written many critical and cultural essays, articles, interviews, and books, and is currently editing the book Further Field, 25 Years of Art, Technology, and Social Change, uh, to be published by Torque. Uh, other recent book publications include Frankenstein Reanimated, Creation and Technology in the 21st Century, published by Torque. Um, State Machines, Reflections and Actions at the Edge of Digital Citizenship, Finance and Art, uh, published by Inc. Amsterdam, and Artists Rethinking the Blockchain uh, from Torque Editions, uh, 2017, from uh, also involved Further Field and Liverpool Press, and uh, currently editing the book Living the Proposition to be published by Goldsmiths UK. So um, without further ado, really excited. Uh, please give a, a great welcome to Mark Garrett. Well, uh, well, thank you everyone for coming along. And uh, yes, so I'm just gonna uh, go straight into it and show some slides and hopefully everyone will get the gist of, uh, well, Furtherfield's grounded spirit in activism in art, technology and social change. Uh, so here we go, Share <clears throat> slides, and there we go. I just want to be able to view my actual thing. <laughs> it won't enlarge it, that's good. It's not good actually. Okay. Uh, can you see me changing the screen at all? No? Okay. Can you see that? Lots of creatures. <laughs> okay, good. Right, so at the moment, uh, who runs Further Field is Ruth Catlow, Dr. Charlotte Frost, and myself. Uh, I recently stepped down as co-director because uh, last year I caught cancer and uh, which knocked me out for six, really. And I'm just gradually coming back into the world again, writing books and uh, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not co-director anymore, although I am co-founder. Uh, so. So Furtherfield is an artist led organisation building online and physical hubs for debate. And I'm uh, just going to get rid of this. That's it. Uh, for debate around critical questions in arts, technology, and social change since 96. Uh, we have a kind of uh, DIWO ethos, which is uh, do it with others, uh, which enlarges artistic freedoms through decentralized peer to peer practices, uh, openness, and collaboration. Uh, exhibitions, events, projects, labs, reviews, articles, and publications. We do over, we've done uh, over 80 digital and hybrid artworks projects featured in actually in Finsbury Park since we've been there, engaging with over 60,000 people, uh, and many existing partnerships with local groups and stakeholders around the area. We're actually centred uh, with Finsbury Park. You've got Islington, Harringay and Hackney. We're kind of like in the centre of those three different uh, London boroughs. Uh, as, 
as Joseph said, we've got two venues and one's uh, Burfield Commons uh, and one's the gallery. And obviously we kind of, in a sense, uh, see it part of a larger network. So a lot of our activities are online as well and other places. So it, it all becomes kind of quite equal in one sense. Uh, so the talk today is uh, I'm going to give you four different contexts and uh, so building grassroots cultural art context in the late 80s and early 90s, which is kind of where the spirit of further field activism was born. And uh, so, yes, and then curating critical perspectives against top down and extractive systems. So it's very much about critiquing hierarchy, patriarch and uh, kind of uh, institutions institutionalized canons and also art dominated by markets. Uh, publishing critiques about art and technology and social change. That's that's very much about some of the books that have been published. And then the last section is very much about living the proposition beyond lip service and a way of life. Uh, and obviously that will unfold as the talk uh, goes on. Uh, so I will present four aspects of Furball's grassroots context since mid 90s. Uh, so elite groups constantly channel our social interactions, cultural identities and interests on their behalf. Uh, the narratives and stories of who we are have become distorted, filtered and engineered following the needs of marketing companies, accepted historical canons, mainstream me news media, the military, numerous corporations and nation states. Like everything else, truth is a commodity, not a right. The highest bidder owns truth and fact. If you can afford it, you can create, alter and sell mass information to millions. How are creative, creative practitioners, academics, researchers and arts organisations navigating their experience and production in ways that make a difference rather than contribute to the issues discussed? The presentation aims to unpack these issues and show examples where artists ask critical questions about the technology that dominates our lives today through their practice. Uh, I wish to discuss how self-organisation has played a part in bringing social change in our focus on art and technology. Uh, also discuss building a grassroots cultural agency in DIY activist led art activities part of a streetwise community which will be based in Bristol uh, then about curating critical perspectives uh, which I've already discussed before uh, so this is basically uh, a short period where in in Bristol I kind of worked with many kind of grassroots artists and uh, we had lots, we were kind of like connected to lots of different groups uh, that did a lot of street arts and which used the streets as a form of hacking. And uh, so this short period was enough to spark a strong connection with other like-minded original thinkers and artists interested in claiming an art context beyond gallery walls and what we felt were imposed colonizing institutional historical narratives. Our mission was to declare an alternative set of values that reflected art, cultural hacking and politics from the streets. It seemed like a small undeclared movement where those not accepted in traditional societal roles and thus ghettoized built their subjectivities and reasons for peer creativity and critical ideas mutually. Uh, this is one where we hacked a board which was part of Tesco's and, uh, and then we also did uh, kinds of like uh, shows in underpasses as well, where we claimed underpasses and set up alternative exhibitions where anyone could bring their own uh, artwork. And uh, we, this was, and the, there was a series of them called Substrasa Galleries. And, um, and this was with Heath Bunting, Louise Mensch, myself and Simon McLennan and, and many others as well, which I should name, but I can't remember all their names. And, uh, and also this is a good example where loads of people used to come and share their 
uh, technology ideas and hacking code and all kinds of nonsense and uh, where we stored on a generator in the actual uh, subway and uh, yeah as you can see and so loads of people would put in and also they'll be taking away actual data as well so it's, it's like a data exchange as well and that actual uh, computer is also a bulletin board uh, that we set up and uh, so it was quite exciting and that was around as it says in 91 92 and we're, so we are exploring how to use technology as well as uh, kind of physical environments around that time and this is uh, Louise who is a performance artist who's uh, uh, I, I think involved lots of ex rebellion uh, stuff at the moment, but she's, uh, yeah, so the whole group of us, we're all kind of exploring our own context still and, and uh, causing disruptions in our, in our own special ways today as well. And uh, I was doing lots of street art as well, as well as the other stuff, which is collaborative. So it's, it's not just about uh, uh, subsuming your identity, it's about bringing your identity to a collective voice at the same time. Uh, this is a uh, pirate radio station. Well, this is one of many pirate radio stations that we used to run. I was one of the main uh, kind of, I suppose, what can you say, content provider where I collect all the, all the material and then I'll compile it to be uh, broadcasted live. Uh, so uh, the pirate radio station, well, this particular one, electromagnetic uh, installation ran uh, for over 18 months, broadcasting to Greater Bristol every weekend. We changed our location for each broadcast and disseminated disinformation to confuse the authorities' tasks with destroying us at the time. We've had a few scrapes with the police in Bristol around that time. Uh, we used a, 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 a yeah, a uh, I won't go into any antidotes, but there's some good stories around that. We used a home-built 20-watt stereo FM transmitter and antenna. All submitted materials provided on audio tape broadcast, regardless of quality or quantity. Uh, we finally had to close down because of uh, surveillance stress. Uh, so after this... Uh, the next venture was a bulletin board system called Cyber Cafe. Uh, a bulletin board system or BBS is a computer system running uh, software that allows users to connect and log into the system using a terminal program. Once logged in, a user can perform functions such as uploading and downloading software and data, reading news and bulletin boards, uh, boards and exchanging messages with other users through electronic mail or uh, public message boards, uh, because it typically involved dialing via a modem linked to a phone line or landline, it made visiting a, a BBS board uh, uh, expensive. People would be paying the same rate as regular phone calls. Contacting bullet board systems in a different region or country was even more expensive. Uh, so I'd, other, I used to be joined in lots of different uh, bulletin boards around the world. One that some may know here, which I'm not sure. There's two actually. There's New World Disorder, which was in uh, the Netherlands, and then there's also Fast Breeder, which was run by Mongrel. Uh, and then there was our Cyber Cafe, but there's lots of others as well. And uh, contacting bulletin board systems. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Oh, so on Rhizome, Rachel Baker recently described her first experience on the Cyber Cafe that uh, BBS, uh, BBS saying, I was at home by myself, plugging in the modem, logging into the Cyber Cafe BBS, staring at the screen terminal window open, wondering what, what I was supposed to do with it. And I remember very clearly the words being typed by a flashing cursor. Hello, Rachel. And I thought, what? How did that happen? It was co sysop Mark Garrett. Mark was very prolific on Cyber Cafe. Uh, you would usually find something every day from Mark. and And... And this is from uh, the recent, well, actually, in 2017, the kind of survey that Rhizome did around uh, kind of uh, net art in the 90s. And this is kind of stuff 
what we were up to at that time. Uh, so now to curating critical perspectives against top-down extractive systems. Well, further builds approach to DIY collaborative infrastructural projects is influenced by renowned community projects from the 80s, such as uh, Paper Tiger TV and Deep Dish TV based in the USA, uh, coinciding with the availability of, of affordable video cameras. These independent decentralized public art TV networks mobilize people to make their media, choosing an alternative relation with media uh, and broadcasting, challenging the central and hierarchically constructed programming at the time. They attempted to democratize the media by facilitating people to people communications. Uh, artistic programming turns the themes and aesthetics of commercial TV on their head. It activated media and activist projects such as the Gulf Crisis TV project in early 90s. Uh, the concerns of these projects can be traced in Fairfield's mission and our online platforms such as Dido, which is 1999 to 1922, which involved a lot of uh, stuff around uh wars in europe at the time and uh and also uh netarati platform that we created a little while back which was kind of similar to facebook but an artist version online and of course further built platforms which will uh we're just un undergone various changes through the years and uh this is one example here of <laughs> one of the many uh multi kinds of uh, multi-platforms uh, that we designed. This was one, I reckon, I, I, yeah, 2004, 2002, 2004, we had this. And as you can see on the left side, you've got the banners there so uh, people can go into the projects that we that we were running at the time. Uh, Dissension Convention, I'll let you know about in a minute. Rosalind was a kind of media upstart where people can get all their terms that they've been writing about actually uh, itemized and referenced before more well-known well -known critics and uh, academics started using the terms about referencing them. Uh, Business the Studio was a real-time uh, mixing platform where people can actually mix their own, that's about 2003 where people can mix their own media, video, sound, et cetera. Uh, and they can collaborate on real time together. And also uh, it, uh, that came from Further Studio, which is below, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. Then their behavior, which is it, we've still got going, just an uh, email community, Further Critic and Further Noise. Further Critic, it's Charlotte's Frost was kind of like where her base, where she would critique a lot of art that was going on at the time. Further Noise was an experimental sound arts collective online that we used to run as well. So we did a lot of stuff and all the stuff you can see like featured works, all that work is reviews that we did a long for a long time and we actually found money to pay people to do reviews. And the reason we wanted to do that because we felt that grassroots arts and technology culture was not being seen by uh, a media art elite as well as an art elite. So what we did was create a alternative art community where people can get their work seen when it's not being seen, even within the media art community. So this is... Uh, no longer running now. This is Further Studio, which basically is a place where artists can apply to have their work uh, seen in real time as they're making it from their computers. And uh, that was funded by the BBC, uh, funny enough. And, uh, and another project was funded by the BBC as well that we did, but this is what I'm talking about. And this is where people can have their work actually be uh, presented as uh, studio critiques in real time from various people around the world, including curators. And uh, so, and Dissension Convention was 2004, where we used Visitor Studio, where people all around, all around the world around 2004 
people protested in real time against the Iraq war. And uh, this is very much where, when the dissension convention uh, coincided with the public, uh, Republican convention in, two, in New York. And we had over 20 national net artists and digital artists broadcasting uh, a kind of collaborative art polemic with a focus on how Bush and the US Republicans negatively influence every locality around the world. Uh, so, and that was distributed inside galleries in New York as well as other environments around the world. Uh, but in New York, this happened to be in real time at Postmasters Gallery, including other artists in New York, uh, uh, making art in real time online, mixing with other people uh, as part of a kind of international real time protest. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that this was new stuff, uh, real time collaboration, art making around that time. And lots of people didn't have a clue what they were looking at. And, uh, and so it's very hard to get funding for this type of stuff. And, uh, so, and when you're an independent arts group and you're kind of a little bit ahead of the curve, it's actually not as ex it's not very easy because you haven't got as much money as you'd expect from doing all this amazing stuff. You know, you learn coding yourself, uh, you teach yourself everything, you're uh, with a group of obsessive polymaths and you're just doing really interesting stuff. But against the kind of singular narrative of lots of cultures, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, the internet was great because it kind of broke down uh, uh, a singularity for more assemblages and networks. Just have some water. This is an example of one of the online platforms we created more recently. Well, actually about six, seven years ago, called Netarati. Uh, it was again ahead of its time before Mastodon. And uh, we were trying to get people to move away from Facebook and uh, Twitter at the time and uh, inviting people to upload their own digital media. And, but even then, people wanted to remain uh, on uh, these large platforms, even though their data was being uh, collected and used uh, you know, for all kinds of clandestine dodginess. And uh, so, so we wanted to cre create a platform which uh, was protected as a safe place for people to go where they weren't being traced by any kind of uh, data company. Uh, but it was difficult because if you're not part of a kind of uh, institutional narrative at the time, you won't get as many people uh, exploring it as, as, as probably is deserving so. So in the end, we decided, oh, sod it, people don't want it. Uh, so we won't do it anymore. And we had about 100 people on there which was great uh, for what it was, but then we decided, uh, and, we've, and we worked with GNU Social, and there's so, some of them are the people that worked with Mastodon later on. So we were actually the testers of platforms like GNU, uh, like Mastodon. We were the first ones testing platforms like that through our community. Uh, in 2006 was a very significant year. Uh, for crystallization of ideas and collaboration in network culture. Our deep involvement in the first season of Media Arts Node London, uh, conceived of as an experiment in tools and structures of cooperation, invented and adapted by artists, technologists and activists, many, but not all, of whom are committed to ideas of social change through their practice. Node London, which stands for Network Open Distributed Events London, was a series of events run by diverse groups of media artists and organisations across London in 2006. This consisted of over really kind of like a, over 100 groups, individuals and organisations. Uh, the purpose was to create an open participatory season, uh, which uh, deconstructed the hierarchy of London centralised curation uh, and the season supported uh, uh, the stimulation of media arts that connected to others in its field and others outside its practice. It was an extremely uh, intense experience for all who were involved. It bridged the gap between large institutions, smaller groups and individuals and their traditional canon oriented structures. Uh, 
There were around 100 events taking place during the month online in homes, small, small and large venues. For example, we held as part of an exhibition and various events at our old warehouse, which was called HTTP, HTTP Gun in 2006 as part of festival. So you can see this that like Andy Deck uh, had a show at that time, which we was featuring, which was uh, basically uh yeah so in this hyper media mediated age content whether produced by artists or journalists crucially affects what people think about how they how uh they understand the world content is not uh where am i going it's not impervious to the software protocols and chicanery that surrounds its delivery uh so that I won't say any more about that because I wanted to go on, but uh, to this, which was uh, Daiwo. So uh, the tendency for infrastructural critique uh, that occurs when many people come together in Daiwo practice returns us to questions about the role of the individual concerning centralized power and behavior and concepts of arts within the logic of scarcity and consumer-led uh, desire. Uh, the term Daiwo, do it with others, was first defined in 2006 on Rosalind's uh, upstart new media art lexicon. It extended the DIY do-it-yourself ethos of early net art punk and situationism towards a more collaborative approach using the internet as an experimental artistic medium and distribution system to ferment grassroots creativity. Even before it was defined, it underpinned everything further field has ever done. So Daiwo uh, is inspired uh, by DIY culture and uh, cultural social hacking rather than perpetuating modernity or a modernist situation where artists become a proxy or products for hierarchical systems and their structures. It challenges and renegotiates the power roles between uh, artists and curators, bringing all actors to the fore so that artists would become co-curators alongside the curators who could also be co-curators. The source materials, digital or physical, uh, are, are open to all to remix, re-edit and redistribute. It's also about crossing over between individuals and collectives where the collective genius of the many gets seen as a critique of modernity and shakes up the mythology of the already extremely well-promoted idea of the singular genius or hero trope. It allows space for a networked openness and peer generosity where a rich mixing of components from different sources crosses over and creatively uh, creates a hybrid context and experience with others. And so if it's Daiwo, uh, basically it enlarges artistic freedoms, uses the metaphors, tools, cultures and process of digital and physical networks. It's led by experimental artistic process rather than utilitarian or theoretical concerns. Uh, a note on that is that the point of a uh, 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 theoretical context very much as far as where we come from, is that our homework is exploring theory where we uh, kind of instigate and implement uh, or initiate theory into part of the practice of what we're doing uh, uh, in making art with others. Uh, it's Daiwo if it disrupts, hi disrupts hierarchies and concepts of ownership, working with decentralized peer-to-peer -peer practices. Uh, another thing about that, uh, is basically we're kind of a bit like uh, the new levelers in the sense that it's about finding new land and new narratives beyond uh, colonized territories, whether it's on the, on the internet or on the land. Uh, it's Daiwo if it involves diverse participants, unwitting and active collaborators, ideas and social ecologies. And, uh, and we believe that you can't have ecology without social ecology. And uh, I'm going to finish that. I can't, actually, I can't see the bottle of text there, so that's why I've just moved on there. <laughs> uh, so 
the first DIY email project started with an email call to email list net behavior, uh, which kind of got about 6,700 people on there. And it did then, it doesn't seem to change people come and go. Uh, the call drew on the mail art tradition proposing uh, to bypass, wait, I'm just going to get rid of that. Curatorial restrictions to promote imaginative exchange between artists and audience on their own terms. Uh, so, so I'm just going to move this. That's it. Uh, peers connect, communicate, and collaborate. Uh, creating controversial structures and shared grassroots cultures uh, through digital online networks and physical environments. And so, and so Daiwo is actually going to talk a little bit more about Daiwo. Daiwo is actually quite uh, internationally used now, and it's kind of a bit like open source culture. It's kind of got its own identity that's gone beyond further field when we started doing it. So loads of people are now kind of incorporate uh, the principles of DIY as part of their DIY practice, uh, but usually with others. So it's not very much about supporting the genius, it's very much about supporting uh, a wider context, a cultural context, but also a collective con context, but also beyond uh, traditional hierarchies. And so, uh, I just wanted to show you some stuff that kind of also relates to that. This is a uh, peer at Biran that shows in 2014. This is in the common space. And they, uh, yep, yeah, some of you, and we also had this exhibition, which is uh, Ivan Purig. I'm just going to move this thing so I can actually see the text. Yeah, Padilla Domine. Uh, Los Ferenotos, uh, someone might have pronounced that better than me, uh, which is exhibited uh, as collaboration with art activists. I mean, oh God, uh, I forgot their name now. Anyway, uh, the thing is the project itself, Art Catalyst, sorry. The project itself uh, was collaborated where uh, Art Catalyst asked us if they could use our space and collaborate with us to show this piece of work. And what this piece of work does is actually, as you can see, the, see the little tiny wheels on the car, is they are actually designed to go on railway lines. And in uh, Mexico, uh, in the 90s, all, most of what well, all the most all the railways were privatized. And uh, what happened that was all the villages that were running their own businesses in Mexico were cut off once all the lines got uh, made obsolete because a lot of them would not be, uh, could not support the shareholders uh, making the money out of the privatized industry of the railway in Mexico. Uh, so what uh, these artists did was actually create this car to, to revisit all those villages around Mexico as part of a project where and and a lot of the, the actual uh railway lines had jungle uh the, which was regrowing over the railway lines so they had to physically chop through some of the jungle uh where the railroad lines were still there so they can reconnect to those villages and tell them their stories of how all their income has gone down and where the communities were isolated and and a lot of them closed down because of privatization just for a few people. Uh, uh, this is a kind of uh, lots kind of just to show a, a kind of perspective on critical curating. This is Julie Chang and Mark America. This is at the, the gallery, Furfield Gallery. Uh, Network of the Unseen. Uh, this was kind of co curated with Greta Lau. And uh, there's the first exhibition that's kind of focused on the intersection of indigenous cultures and, and zeitgeist digital practices. So, uh, so Aboriginal artists uh, using digital technology. 
Uh, the exhibition event tackles uh, digital colonialism, uh, remoteness and cultural marginalization and uh, online world to universal concerns around cultural change as a result of technical uh, technological migration. And that was 2016. And then we have the human face of cryptocurrencies, which was kind of like a very early cryptocurrency exhibition around blockchain that we did, which was 2015. Uh, that which was two years before we wrote uh, Artists We Think in the Blockchain. But we also had other exhibitions, uh, New World Order and some others that we did as well, and also different publications around that time. And uh, so the, the Human Face of Crypto Economies was an exhibition featuring, I've just got to move this, yeah. Artworks have been how we produce, exchange and value things differently in the age of the blockchain, appealing to our curiosity, emotion and irrationality. International artists see emerging technologies, mass behaviours and peer to peer concepts to create artworks that reveal ideas for a radically transformed artistic, economic, social feature. And so uh, this featured Emily Brooks and Maxine Marion, Shirley Chang. Sarah T. Gold, Jennifer Limarone, Ria Myers, and uh, the Museum of Contemporary Commodities, and the London School of Financial Arts, and the Robin Hood uh, Paroptive, which was uh, a really important group that was going then in from the Netherlands. And uh, so now I'm just going to show you a few publications of what we've been involved with. So this goes back to 2010. And this is uh, artists rethinking games. So we have you know, obviously, we've been involved with games for a little while, and curating games exhibitions uh, around, I think from 2006 as well, actually, around that time. But we decided to write a book about it, about some of the work that we come across from a situationist perspective. And so digital games are important, not only because of their cultural ubiquity or their sales figures, but for what they can offer as a space for creative practice. Games are significant for what they embody, human computer interface, notions of agency, sociality, visualization, cybernetics, representation, embodiment, activism, narrative and play. These and a whole host of other issues are significant, not only to the game designer, but also represent in the work of the artist and, and artist that thinks and rethinks games, reappropriated for activism, activation, commentary and critique with games and culture. Artists have responded vigorously. And this, is, uh, this book was actually used by many different uh, universities around the world uh, because it's one of the first uh, media art books uh, as part of kind of like art media practice that actually dealt faced on face on with uh, games culture and uh, in a way that was understandable to students as well. And uh, in 2017, we uh, published artists we think in the blockchain and that's with Cat Lowe and myself, Nathan Jones and Sam Skinner at Talk Editions and Furtherfield. And so I won't go on about this because there's a few more things to talk about. The blockchain is widely heralded as the new internet, another dimension and an ever faster, even more powerful interlocking of ideas, actions and values. Principally, the blockchain is a ledger uh, distributed across a large array of machines that enables digital ownership and exchange without a central administering body. Within the arts, it has profound implications, as we all know now, especially, uh, profound implications as both a means of organizing and distributing material, and as a new subject and medium for artistic exploration. Now, so this was before uh, NFTs, there were some NFTs being made uh, before and during this time, but not that many. And not that much. And it, uh, later on, as we all know, uh, that kind of became much more of a frenzied experience for many. Uh, but we're still interested in 
uh, the infrastructures of technology, not necessarily the image. And uh, so, because if you control the infrastructure, you control your identity, the politics, who you are, and what you can do with the medium. Uh, so this is from Charlotte, who's part of Birthfield, and uh, so, and this was uh, art criticism online, uh, a history. Uh, to Arts Future book. So basically the mainstream press often celebrates tweeting, Facebooking and gramming of art commentary. Yet online forms of art criticism have a much longer and more varied history than we think, far preceding the art discussions happening on the likes of Twitter and Facebook. Before art discussions took place on social media, there were networked art projects and art critical bulletin board systems, email discussion lists and blogs. Art Criticism, criticism Online is a history that provides the first in-depth history of art criticism following the internet. The book considers the core stages of development and considers where critical uh, practice is heading in the future. And this is a book that uh, I co-published last year with uh, Yanis uh, Kalidis uh, from Cyprus, from uh, Nîmes, and uh, lots of different artists are involved in this uh, with articles, critical articles, really worth looking into. So it's uh, Frankenstein Reanimated presents a dynamic collection of artworks, essays, and Conversations addressing surveillance, biohacking, viruses, uh, colonialism, digital culture, and more. It retraces and contextualizes three international art exhibitions exploring themes within Frankenstein and speculates on what Mary Shelley would think about the world today. Co collectively, the book offers a lens through which to look at our current situation and, and how art practices shape and are shaped by contemporary society. Uh, this other book is by Ruth Catlow and Penny Rafferty, which is also part of Furtherfield, uh, which is uh, Radical Friends, Decentralised Autonomous Organisation uh, uh, Installations and the Arts. So uh, decentralized autonomous uh, organizations, DOAs offer unique tools for translocal peers to encode rules, relations and values into their joint ventures using blockchain technology. This new book edited by Ruth Catlow and Penny Rafferty, who have been at the forefront of investigations into the relationship between DAOs and the arts, constitutes over five years of research of essays, interviews, exercises and prototypes from leading thinkers, artists, and technological and technologists across this emerging field. And so we move into living the proposition. And uh, I just wanted to go back, make sure I'm not missing any. Uh, yes, that's where I need to be going to. And so I'm just going to go to this. So living the proposition uh, beyond lip service a way of life. Uh, so this is a, uh, what can I say about this? But this is a, we won't fly for art as a project we did as part of our kind of uh, media arts, ecologies, uh, research body, uh, but lasted about five years and then kind of just continued into part of further field. But it officially started in 2009 and we wanted to create a kind of cultural polemic around the big issues of the day where it showed the impossibility at the time of facing the reality of climate change where you could actually see the problems rather than uh, just hiding the problems. And so uh, the first discussions on how Furfield World would infrastructurally approach and include environmental questions be began kind of in 2007 at the time it was also a response to our readings of heat how to stop the planet burning which author George Monbiot describes as a manifesto for action and thoughts experiments we drew on Monbiot's in-depth analysis to question how a network of artists such as the Furtherfield community might take responsibility and further enhance dialogue and actions regarding climate change. 
We asked how it directly informs our practice and we could integrate a more ecological vision as part of Furfield's interaction with the world. Uh, Catlow and I uh, published a manifesto in Pledge Bank, a platform allowing users to set up pledges and encourage others to sign up for them. The manifesto functioned as a simple participatory algorithm, a pyramid pledge for exponential growth that could change how the contemporary art world felt uh, and operated for millions of art workers on the ground. It was a public art experiment examining the complexities and limits of individual agency and engagement with communal questions. It aimed uh, for material impact and a de-escalation of carbon fueled, fueled high altitude, high velocity, global art careering. For six months, we chose to cover uh, less physical distance, move more slowly between destinations to look future world with more attention to view from the ground, the network, and ways to connect with others around the world. The plan intended to use the tactic of low level distributed trouble making to increase solidarity and to rehearse by choice some of the inconveniences of these coming changes. And so a good example is that we refuse to go to conferences around the world by a plane and other people for six months collaborated with us in doing the same thing. So there's about 100 artists that actually uh, collaborated and with us decided not to go to any conferences because of uh, fueling the world and the planet uh, through conferences around the world and centralization. And so obviously it's a difficult one because a lot of people go to conferences, especially artists, to go and get seen, to get their work seen. And so it's a catch-22, but at the same time, it highlights the issue that we're dealing with, that we need to solve the problem because because people are reliant on these capital networks and also a representation and knowledge sharing through these systems that are burning the planet up. Uh, Ruth went to ICEA around this time <coughs> by train uh, to, to discuss the project uh, to an activist project there. I can't remember what it was now. Anyway, and uh, it would normally take three hours to go by plane. It took her 10 days by train and it cost three times the amount. Uh, which gives you some idea how it is really set up to kill the planet, how our systems are just really aren't working. And we highlighted this in 2009. We got criticised by people for it, but it's the truth. Uh, then we did a Zero Dollar Laptop, which is a kind of initiative that alerted people to the potential free and open source software boss to extend their personal computers' lives and free themselves from the shackles of techno-consumerism. The project also responded to and critiqued the colonial and consumerist values of the philanthropic uh, One Laptop Per Child, or OLPC program, headed by MIT uh, professor uh, Nicholas Negroponte. Instead of making new technology uh, become addictive, to young children in uh, uh, in kind of like places where companies are oppressing poor people. We felt Zero uh, Dollar Laptop proposed a better alternative, which they didn't have to pay for the software and they could recycle the technology, reuse it, skinning up and learn peer-to-peer -peer learning for their own localities and cultures. Uh, the program consisted of public debates, exhibitions and workshops about art, technology and environments inspired by the Zero to Laptop Manifesto. Uh, this was with Access Space as an open source media lab based in central Sheffield. Uh, it, offers, uh, it offered renewed and donated computer technology to provide internet access and open source creative tools free of charge five days a week. Uh, it started in 2000, became the longest running free internet project in the UK, uh, and it's still going. 
The artistic team for this project uh, was Jake Harris, James Wallbank, myself with Kat Lowe, and Olga Panades or Panades, and uh, which was Furfield. And I already had a strong history and connection with some Mungo's uh, homeless charity, which I worked with part time as an art tutor and project worker. And also I worked with technologies there uh, from the early 90s to the mid 2000s. But basically, I worked at uh, St. Mungo's Homeless. Instead of going to university, basically, I worked in homeless centres for 12 years, uh, which taught me a lot about various things. And another kind of live in the proposition thing so you live you don't you don't pay it lip service you live it so you make it real uh is a good example of that it's the hologram feminist peer-to-peer -peer help for a post-pandemic future by uh cassie thornton in an area in an era where capitalism leaves so many to suffer and to die with neoliberal self-care offer a little more than a band-aid how can we take health and care back into our hands? The hologram Cassie Thornton puts forward as a bold vision for revolutionary care, a viral peer-to-peer -peer feminist health network. If you wanna read more about this, published in 2020 uh, in Vagabonds, and I've, I've got an interview with Cassie Thornton uh, in this publication. Uh, it's also part of Pluto Press and uh there's a bit of text here i can read here uh so drawing on radical models developed in the greek in the greek solidarity clinics during a decade of crisis and directly engaging with discussions around mutual aid and the coronavirus pandemic the hologram develops the skills and relationships we desperately need for the anti-capitalist struggles of the present and the post-capitalist society of the future uh, so one part, one part art, one part activism, activism, and one part science fiction. This book offers the reader to guide this, uh, the, uh, to establishing a hologram network and reflections on this co cooperative work in progress. And there's a lot more to it than that, and it's worth investigating. Uh, this is something that uh, is worth looking at as well. Before. I got ill, <laughs> I did this project and I did it on my own rather than with Furberfield, which is an open knowledge list for all to add at will uh, and to share with others using Diwo principles. So basically is an open peer-to-peer -peer resource for AI technology. And the way I set it up was basically uh, you set up a page on Rise Up, and then uh, where people just add their own data of all the AI projects that they've either written about or been involved in, uh, rather than a centralised kind of uh, blocked frameworks where you're only going to get certain hierarchies or certain groups just referring to each other. I thought it would be really interesting to have a much more extensive, wider collaborative platform where people are just uploading all the data themselves from around the world and there's thousands of uh kinds of uh inputs by various people individuals some well known some not it's 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 very a kind of massive collaboration and uh yes and this is still available for people to view and uh, I've been asked to work with some other groups about it. I was going to work with Pirate Care about it, and I might still do that. But I, I'm gradually getting better, so I might do that, or I might work with other universities if they're interested to create another open source version of this project uh, with an institution I'll be quite interested in as well. Uh, so this is a so just to get to much more contemporary. Uh, stuff that's going on at Furberfield at the moment, especially in the park. There's obviously there's loads of projects I haven't mentioned, which I wish I could, but I can't, as you know. And so uh, it's worth reference, referencing some of the interspecies work that we're working on in the park itself. So interspecies festival of Princeton Park just took place. Uh, it's actually 2023, but it was originally in 2022, but we had COVID, so it's uh, 2023. Uh, participants learn about diversity, habitats in the park, 
uh, more than perspectives, more than human perspectives, all participants help to build a story and shape what happens in a set of LARPs or live action role play games for the Treaty of Finchley Park uh, till 2025. Uh, think like a dog, be, or even grass, and help change the way we all see and participate in our local urban green spaces forever. Uh, so basically, I just wanted to, to read a little quote by, I'll just see if, uh, yeah, a little quote by, what's it, Kate Genevieve, who wrote her own experience of this project. She goes, the experience is a living, barking, honking, uh, scuffling, waddling testament to communal creativity. In the words of Ruth Catlow, this playful make belief believe in acts a prefigurative politics that is just about wild and weird enough to provoke fresh action for the more than human ecologies of London. I participated on a sweltering Sunday, big admiration to my fellow laughers who showed up sporting heavy squirrel tails and woolen paws in the heat. The event is still with me weeks after, having spent a few days of 2023 in a bee mask. Now, each time I spot a bee, I feel a buzz of attention and kinship. The Interspecies Festival blends inspiration from collective action and creative movements like Occupy, as well as LARP's live action role play and a bevy of artistic practices engaged in anticipatory futures and serious make-believe. The team at Furtherfield diligently craft interspecies journeys, free and open to all as an invitation to play with a mentor species in full-blooded ways, discovering alternative imaginaries through participation. Through this collective experience, the characters develop the interspecies treaty obligations together. The treaty is to be formally presented to the council in 2025. The work enacts a fresh kind of relational activism that revolves how new structural forms of understandings emerge from imaginative ecological play. And Ruth and the crew that's involved with uh, the Interspecies Project is also working with uh, larger groups that work uh, with the government, like DEFRA, where they do LARPs around similar kinds of discussions. And I've just got this last thing to say, but I must have water because. Uh, uh, which is this. So we need to build on, reevaluate, and relearn from an early progressive and insightful uh, and insightful enrichments that art, technology, and activism have generously produced and given us through the years into more personalized, informed, shared grounded disruptions and critically engaged interdependent systems and activi activities of mutual alliances. Rather than proposing images of technologies of better lives, we must live the worlds we propose to bring about. This requires the inclusion of others where otherness becomes mutually affirmed as part of our social being and allowing us to reflect from within our production this is about mutual aid, helping each other become the people we wish to be through our working conditions and creative endeavours. How can we nourish our artistic and imaginative needs from the ground up without making the elite stronger? Who can we trust to collaborate with to enhance our art processing contexts, ecological and social engaged practices? How can we create the necessary intuitively based platforms and create open safe spaces on the ground with continuing life-changing projects? How can we set up friendly systems to develop nourishing decentralized and local situations beyond lip service and the usual tech industry bias and institutional hierarchies that intentionally or blindly repeat damaging patriarchal blueprints? We are the answer. And we're already here. And we have the tools and assistance that our peers have built to help forge mutual and social aid on our shared terms. 
by living the proposition, we build better presents and futures that allow our artistic production and activist intentions to exist in ways that are closer to our visions and needs. It's about reconnecting to our battered core values, what we wanted to be before we were diverted from our personal and collective desires. And there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That's fantastic. Um, could you stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Uh, is that gone? It's going. It's still there. Is it? Oh, I clicked it off. That's weird. I see your Instagram now. Uh, ooh, uh, <laughs> wait, wait there. Ah. <clears throat> Let me just check that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And that. How's that? Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Well, we have a, a, a few minutes for some, some questions and discussion. Thank you for the inspiring talk. It's a really great way to start the day. Um, uh, any questions, any comments?